each trace is quantitatively in this system. Let me take you now to, to one of our field sites in the Clare Valley in South Australia. So we're in southeastern Australia, so here is a, is a regional map for you where uh, Adelaide is in here. Clare Valley is about 100, 100 150 kilometres north of Adelaide. And I'll also point out to you, you can sort of just see here, there's a mountain range that runs east of Adelaide up towards the, uh, the Flinders Ranges, about 1,000 kilometres long, and I'll, I'll mention that again in a minute. Clare Valley is one of Australia's premium wine areas. And with, with irrigation of the, of the vines during summer, groundwater was used for irrigation, and there was concern about whether the groundwater system could support expansion of the wine industry. Incidentally, the way it works with wine is that the more you irrigate, the more grapes you get, but the worse it tastes. So in Clare, which is one of the premium areas, they're only putting on a relatively small amount of water, but it's nevertheless important, and they wanted to understand what the recharge rate to those aquifers was. This is the, the mountain range that I mentioned. This is a, a geological feature called the Adelaide Geosyncline that extends from, from south of Adelaide up to the north of South Australia. And so we're talking about metamorphosed sediments. We're talking about shales, slates, dolomites, quartzites, all low porosity, highly faulted and folded. Um, the Clare Valley sits in this portion here on the western limb of the geosyncline. So the bedding plane is essentially vertical. These aquifers have pretty much been tipped on end in this point here. We're looking at the bedding plane in this photo here. So this is an exposure um, for a, actually for a supermarket out, a car park just, just off screen. But we're seeing the bedding plane and we can see that we would imagine the bedding plane is a significant avenue for groundwater flow, groundwater transport. But we can also see a number of horizontal, sub-horizontal fractures and some more inclined fractures, a little bit more difficult to see. So highly complex system hydraulically, we would imagine. What we did is we dug some large diameter 10 inch and 12 inch wells down to 100 metres, and within that we installed a number of 50 millimetre PVC piezometers so we could collect water from different depths. And we had two of these side by side, so essentially we were able to sample the aquifer from just near the water table down to approximately 100 metres depth and look at how the age of the water changed with depth. This is the results from two of our field sites. Don't want you to worry at all about the numbers here. So the top four graphs is one field site, the lower four is the second site. And we're looking at carbon-14, chlorofluorocarbons, tritium on the right, chlorine-36 I haven't talked about. Chlorine-36 is similar to tritium. It's a tracer from the bombs in the 1950s and 1960s. So four different tracers, two sites. Each circle represents the concentration of that tracer we measured in the piezometer screened at that depth. Don't want you to worry at all about the numbers. Look how smooth the curves are. Look how remarkably smooth that data is in a highly, highly complex system. If I showed you a plot of hydraulic conductivity in this system, and I'll show that to you in a minute, it doesn't look as smooth as that. Highly variable over four, five, six orders of magnitude. Look how beautifully smooth these traces profiles are. And that was really exciting to us. And that said, suggested to us that somehow these traces are averaging over a large enough area that they're not seeing that local scale heterogeneity, that variation. They're averaging processes and somehow telling us about system processes, we believe. If you imagine this water sample here at 40 metres depth, that water sample hasn't just come down from 40 metres. That's probably come from several kilometres up gradient and moved over a very long flow path until we sampled it. So each of these samples are measuring over a large, large area. I want to talk a little bit more about that effect of mixing. We did some modelling of that, and we can model flow and transport in these fractured rock systems, and the models we use are somewhat simplistic. Usually we assume that fractures are, have parallel sides, and fractures are parallel to each other and evenly sp spaced, which we know they're not but simple models, and we can simulate solute transport through that and diffusive mixing with the, between the young water and the fractures and the old water in the matrix. And that's just what we've done here. This is just a generic hypothetical simulation. 
So we've simulated for a matrix porosity of 10% of certain value of diffusion coefficient, the values aren't important. And we've simulated a water velocity through the fractures, VW here, of 60 metres per year and looked at what the traces, what CFC concentrations would look like in that hypothetical system. And that's what's shown on the right. And I just want you to focus on what's happening at 15 metres depth. This point here, the CFC concentration would measure would be about 180 parts per trillion. And that is that's the concentration there was in the atmosphere 25 years ago. So we would estimate the age of that water, the apparent age of that water using CFC 12 to be 25 years. But I just told you that we simulated a velocity through the fractures of 60 metres per year. So the water at 15 metres isn't 25 years old. It's a quarter of a year old. So the, the tracer age is very, very different than the hydraulic age of that water because this tracer age of 25 years has got some water that's a quarter of a year old in it, year old in it but it's also got some, a little bit of water that's maybe hundreds or thousands of years old mixed in with it out of the rock mass. And so the tracers aren't giving us a reliable age of the, of the hydraulic age of the water. What we wanted to do is to see if we could actually correct for that process and try and use the traces quantitatively in this system. So what we did, is, and we've just done this analytically, uh, we've done it both analytically and numerically, I'll show you the simple analytical solution we did. So firstly we just approximated uh, the CFC age, this is the CFC concentrations in the atmosphere in red, we if we approximate that by a blue curve, because anyone that knows anything about maths knows that if you use exponential functions the maths gets easier, right? So we approximate it with an exponential function. If we do that, we can actually solve the equations for flow through the fractures and we derive an equation that relates the change in age with depth, how quickly the water gets old with depth or appears to get old with depth, according to the traces. We relate that to various fracture and matrix parameters. Okay? We, can, we can come up with an equation. If we were in a, a porous media system, we wouldn't need any of this stuff here in the square parentheses. In a porous media, the age gradient is equal to the inverse of the vertical water velocity. Water age gradient is years per metre that the water gets older. The velocity is metres per year. They're the opposite of each other. So this is our correction term for that matrix diffusion process. Given, admittedly, given a, a reasonably simple model of fractures and matrix. And OK, we need to know, to perform this correction, we need to know matrix porosities, matrix diffusion coefficients, fracture apertures. We need to know some of these parameters that aren't necessarily to determine in fracture rocks. But it turns out, nevertheless, that it is, it is easier to, to estimate these parameters and make this a correction to the traces and then use the traces to estimate the water velocities. It's more accurate to do that than to try and estimate the water velocities using hydraulics despite the fact that a number of these parameters are actually difficult to estimate. So what we've done, that's just the, just the equation that I just described to you. We've essentially solved the chemistry equations and the hydraulic equations simultaneously. The second equation is just Darcy's law written vertically. Okay? The aquifer recharge rate is related to the hydraulic conductivity times the vertical head gradient. The third equation, this is just conservation of mass. It just says that the velocity through the fracture is related to the average velocity or the recharge rate by the ratio of the fracture spacing, big B, to the fracture aperture, little b. It's just really a mass balance conservation of mass equation. The, th the last equation is one that might be familiar to some of you, sometimes called the cubic law, just expresses the relationship between hydraulic conductivity and the fracture spacing and fracture aperture for a, a uniformly, evenly fractured rock. So, so we've essentially just solved those equations simultaneously to try and correct for that matrix diffusion process on tracer ages. Just a little bit more data. I told you I'd show you the hydraulic conductivity profile at one of these sites. That's it there. Not nearly as smooth as the tracer concentrations. This is on a log scale. So we, and this one, we couldn't even pump this one down. We couldn't even measure K there because we couldn't draw it down. 
huge variation in hydraulic conductivity. For the purposes of our calculation, we need a value of hydraulic conductivity to go in our sums. So we've assumed an average value of about half a metre per day. Highly uncertain, I will confess. But we need a value for the equations. We'll come back to that. Um, hydraulic head profile, just to show you, we don't use hydraulic head in the calculations, but it actually it falls out. It's something we calculate. And across on the right-hand side of the CFC concentrations, I've turned them here into CFC ages. And so we get an apparent increase in age with depth of about 0.1, meters, 0.1 years per metre. Leaping straight to the results. So we solve four equations simultaneously. We can estimate four things. The four things we estimate are there in black. The parameters that we needed into those equations are in, are in brown here. We use the uh, hydraulic conductivity, that, the age gradient that we can measure quite accurately the hydraulic conductivity that we can't measure very accurately at all. Diffusion coefficient, that, um, diffusion coefficient we took from the literature, which is a really fancy way of saying we guessed. Uh, but diffusion coefficient is actually reasonably measurable in hard rock. We can measure diffusion coefficients. Matrix porosity we measured, and a fracture spacing we tried to measure an outcrop is about 16 centimetres. So we solve those equations, we calculate the head gradient actually is consistent with what we measure, which is encouraging. We calculate a velocity of water through the fractures, we calculate a fracture aperture, and we calculate a recharge rate, which turns out to be a sensible sort of number, which was really encouraging. Rainfall in the Clare Valley is about 600 millimetres per year. We calculate with this approach a recharge rate of about 100 millimetres per year. So that's a believable sort of number. It's the sort of number we'd expect. What's important is not just that we can calculate a number, is how sensitive is that number to the different parameters that we needed to calculate it because some of those parameters we didn't know very well. And so this is just shown here. This just shows how much the recharge rate would change as I varied any of these input parameters. And what, so red bar, big red bars is bad, little red bars is good, okay? And so we need to know the fracture spacing reasonably well. We need to know the age gradient reasonably well. They're reasonably measurable. We reckon we've got them pretty well. We need to know the matrix porosity. We need to know the diffusion coefficient. We can sort of measure that a bit. We're actually totally insensitive to hydraulic conductivity. It turns out we don't need to know it to use traces in this way. Uh, and that's encouraging, because that's probably the least well-known parameter in this system. Of course, if we were just to use hydraulics to estimate flow rate, then our uncertainty in recharge would be proportional to uncertainty in hydraulic conductivity, which is huge. The reason we're insensitive to hydraulic conductivity is because the traces are actually insensitive to the fracture aperture. So just to explain why that is. So here I've got two systems, both with the same recharge rate, the same overall water flux through the system. Little skinny fractures here on the right, big fat fractures here on the left. In this system on the right, because we've got narrower fractures, we must have much higher water velocities through them for the same overall flux. We've got much higher velocities on this scale. And that would expect, you'd expect that to make the tracer move much further down through the system, because there's high velocity. But on the right, we also have much higher surface area to volume ratio of the fractures. And that means this matrix diffusion process, which essentially retards tracer transport, is much higher in this case than it is with the larger fractures. And those two things almost exactly balance. The higher velocities is almost exactly balanced by the increased retardation by matrix diffusion. So in terms of traces, these two systems are identical. They give us almost the same tracer distribution. Whereas hydraulically, they're incredibly different. And so that's why we think traces have some value in this system, because the hardest to know thing in a fractured rock, the thing that's hardest to know about, is the size of those fractures. And hydraulically, if we get the fracture size a little bit wrong, we get the flux very wrong. OK, there's some things I haven't told you about today. Not all traces behave conservatively in all environments. Anyone that's tried to do carbon-14 dating in a limestone aquifer knows that it can be complicated. It's hard to disentangle the carbonate from the water from the carbonate in the rocks. There are some issues in, with CFCs in some systems, in some anaerobic groundwaters, CFCs can degrade. 
There's also some issues with background concentrations in some areas. You don't do CFC dating of water beneath a landfill where people have been throwing fridges and air conditioning systems.